you probably clicked on this video because you're either an investor in Beam Therapeutic stock or you're thinking about investing in the company. And today we're going to talk about patents and partners. And while we're no experts at patents, we'll try to take a look at what they've licensed and from whom, and then which partners they've aligned themselves with. So when we invest in gene editing companies, we need to break some rules. That is, we're investing in a story, which is something we don't typically do. So we had to take a special approach to the, the gene editing investment thesis, which started by looking at all the possible names that you could invest in. So we wrote a piece. I'll include a link to that piece in the description of this video. And it was titled something to the effect of 27 gene editing stocks. And you can see some of the names above there. And then we vetted this list and reduced it down to five names, one of it, which was Beam Therapeutics. And our last article was on Editas. And I'll also put a link to that piece in the description of this video. Now, in the Editas piece, we looked at how these three gentlemen who founded Editas along with George Church went on to found Beam Therapeutics. And the technology that they invented to found this new company is called base editing. And the comments here are from George Church, who is the co-founder of Editas, along with these three gentlemen. He said that what often passes as genome editing would more appropriately be called genome vandalism. So this new method, base editing, is very precise and it avoids a lot of the potential problems that earlier approaches to CRISPR had run into. So when we look at base editing, this is a great diagram from Beam Therapeutics that makes it very easy to understand. So initially we had thought that base editing was something entirely different from CRISPR. Well, it turns out that CRISPR is a part of base editing in that the um, the whole process has two parts, really. First is to find out where to make the edit. So you need a guide. And then the technique of actually making the edit. And in this case, they're using an enzyme to make the edit. So it's a very precise form of gene editing where they use the component of CRISPR to find out where they need to make the change. And then this base editor to make a very clean change, which doesn't require a double strand DNA break. So the incorrect single letters that base editing can address are responsible for approximately 58% of genetic errors associated with disease. So that's pretty easy to understand, but it begs a, a few questions right off the bat. First of all, you know, every time we turn around, there's a new gene editing technology that people are talking about. Is there a better technology on the rise? And that would probably be the first question we'd have. And then are there alternative base editing approaches that, that fall outside the intellectual property portfolio of Beam? And then what interest has this technology attracted? And these are the questions we're gonna try to answer today. And we'll start by looking at intellectual property that they've licensed. This is taken out of the most recent 10K. We've put the pages here. So if you pull that the link to that 10K, you can go right to the pages that talk about these agreements. They're rather lengthy, but we tried to make them simple and listed out the four main partners they've licensed technology from. The second one is quite interesting. That's Editas Medicine. And the agreement with the Broad Institute is also interesting. And we'll talk about why that is. Now, starting with the Editas patents, I'm sure Editas investors, of which there are quite a few, uh, would be interested in knowing some more details. So essentially, they've licensed technology from Editas. I believe it was in 2018. And if they commercialize a therapy, then Editas needs to receive from Beam royalty rates that it owes to Broad Institute, Harvard, or MGH. And those are just passed through, right? Plus that, plus then they need to pay low to mid single digit royalties on net sales of licensed products if and only if these products are covered by a licensed Editas owned patent, all right? And then as part of that deal, Editas received equity from Beam and vice versa. And then Editas sold their Beam equity after the IPO. So you can look in the Editas filings and see 
a much more simpler description of this agreement, but it's notable that Beam has licensed technology from Edita. So that was the, the second bullet point. And then this third bit that Beam has licensed from the Broad Institute certain rights to RNA based editing technology, including they say CAS 13 and CAS 12B. So we'll try to keep this really simple because we're very simple people. If you recall when CRISPR first came out, you would see this this term CRISPR Cas9, right? You'd see that mentioned or CRISPR or CRISPR Cas9. That really describes those two pieces we looked at earlier, where CRISPR is the guide and Cas9 is the enzyme that makes the change. Well, all that Beam has done here is said that they have a better enzyme that can do cleaner editing, right? This whole idea of base editing and the Cas12b nucleus family of gene editing enzymes has been licensed from the Broad Institute. So that's a core component of beam therapeutics technology. You can see here, we took this from a firm called, I think it's Research Arc in our uh, accompanying research piece that we did for this presentation, which details all this information It has links to this stuff. But this was a great diagram that somewhat simply explains it and that the first and best characterized single protein CRISPR effector. So the initial variation of CRISPR utilized Cas9. And since then, there have been other variations. You can see Cas12 is listed here. So that's a notable part of the technology that Beam Therapeutics has. And you see here, it's exclusive and inclusive. So this statement here, they say, through a license agreement with Broad and Harvard, Beam has exclusively licensed, that's great, the use of certain RNA-based editing technology and Cas12b nucleus technology for all applications. So that seems to be a, um, as we said, exclusive only to Beam and inclusive of all applications. That seems to have a lot of promise in terms of having their intellectual property portfolio wrapped up. Now, the biggest proof of that you have something notable is when um, big players come sniffing around. So the Pfizer deal is a big one. And Pfizer is the biggest pharmaceutical company by revenues and third biggest by market cap. Here's an interesting side note. This is fascinating. 2021 revenues for Pfizer were 81.3 billion, 45% of which, so that's 36.8 billion, came from COVID-19 vaccine sales. That's crazy. So they, Pfizer and Beam, entered into a four-year research collaboration agreement that was earlier this year for three targets for rare genetic diseases of the liver, muscle, and central nervous system. We don't really care much about the details there. We just want to see Pfizer develop something and take it to market so that Beam can start making some money. All that Beam needs to focus on right now is just surviving until the cash spigot gets turned on. So as part of the uh, Pfizer deal, they received an upfront payment of $300 million, Beam did, and they'll recognize that as revenue over four years. So they receive the money, but they'll recognize it as revenue over time. And then there's a potential of $1.35 billion more dollars across all these three programs of milestone payments. And there's also this interesting option that Beam Therapeutics has to partner with Pfizer on bringing one of these three potential treatments to market. Now, if Pfizer doesn't choose to move forward with any of these, then Beam retains the right to do that themselves. And as we know, we've looked at uh, the case with uh, Editas and Allergen, for example, it's the kiss of death. So the CEO will try to spin it as, oh, it's great. We have our own programs back, but that's not really how it works. If Pfizer doesn't move forward with one of these three treatments, that's a bad omen for Beam Therapeutics. So getting back to the details here, that option for Beam is to share net profits as well as development and commercialization costs in a 65, 35% split where Pfizer sits on the, the upper half of that. And that would be an option that Beam Therapeutics can exercise, but they have to, I believe, pay a percentage of what Pfizer has already paid or something. There's a, a cost associated with that. But it's an interesting setup that gives Beam uh, some potential upside if things turn out quite rosy with one of these three programs that Pfizer's working on. So 
Uh, well, we look at the other firms, and that was the biggest pharmaceutical company, certainly the most notable player that uh, Beam has partnered with. But when we look at some of the other partnerships here, you've got a firm called Santa Biotechnology. Very interesting. They uh, started out by closing this massive $700 million Series A in 2020. Then a year later, they raised another $587 million in an IPO that was the largest ever for a preclinical biotech company. So there was a lot of buzz around this firm. And they utilize engineered cells as medicines. Today, they went from $6 billion valuation at the time of their IPO to uh, under a billion dollars today. So they had paid Beam in October of last year $50 million for non-exclusive rights to CRISPR-Cas12B nucleus system for the development of some of their engineered cellular therapy programs. We'd be concerned that this firm can survive long enough to get a drug to market, being how small they are in its early days. So apparently they have access to deep pockets so that hopefully can get them through but very early stage contrast that to this next company apellus pharmaceuticals which actually has a drug that they recently started marketing in the u.s it's called empavelli and the disease is probably one of the most difficult to pronounce i've come across yet this pnh but it doesn't really matter they they've they have this pipeline and they've actually brought a product to market so that's a um, great sign they're 4.7 billion dollar firm now they just need to start selling a lot of that uh, um, therapy so they partnered with beam in a similar structure to how pfizer partnered except they have six programs and i think it's a 50 50 split option that beam has so this was a another firm they're doing similar to what santa's doing they're you know engineering cells for therapy so that's another partner that um, Beam has gotten into bed with. And then Prime Medicine. So this one's particularly interesting because after Mr. Liu, one of the co-founders of Beam, founded Beam Therapeutics, he then went and founded another firm called Prime Medicine. And they were in stealth mode for a while. They raised $315 million to bring the world, again, to our earlier comment about new gene editing technologies, they're going to bring the world prime editing, which can address more than 90% of known disease causing mutations. So that's pretty promising. You can see here the description is that it acts like a DNA word processor, processor with this search and replace functionality without causing that double strand DNA breakage. So a promising technology, no doubt. And the two companies swapped technology licenses and stock. So that's about the extent to which Beam and Prime Medicine are collaborating in terms of what we're able to understand by looking at the 10K. Again, we all have access to the same information. So in the research piece that accompanies this, I put um, a list of how you can search for these various partnerships and look up this information on your own if you're interested in digging into the detail. There's quite a bit of it, but we tried to make it quite simple in that research piece. Then there's Verve Therapeutics. This firm came up when we were vetting those 27 gene editing stocks and they were co-founded by one of the co-founders of Beam Therapeutics. They're planning to do a one and done shot for cholesterol. So as you get older, you start realizing that old, uh, older people generally take cholesterol pills to manage their uh, high cholesterol. And one such pill is Lipitor. This is quite interesting. That was listed by Kiplinger as the biggest blockbuster drug of all time with Pfizer bringing in lifetime revenues of $150 billion, more than that. And that was back in 2018, so a very successful drug. If you can come up with a shot that displaces that drug, wow, right? So that's what Verve is working on. And they did a technology exchange with Beam Therapeutics. It's very similar to the prime medicine deal we just talked about. And then of course, Beam has their internal programs. So these, out of these, the one to watch is Beam 101, which plans to enroll their first subject in the second half of 2022. No surprises here, targeting sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia. Again, we see um, what Editas is targeting that, and I believe Intellia and CRISPR. Um, we haven't done our pieces on those two firms yet. Those will be coming up next. But the point is here that um, Beam is uh, behind the eight ball when it comes to bringing their product to market because CRISPR is 
ahead of them in the same way that CRISPR is ahead of Editas. But uh, at any rate, the one to watch here that's furthest along, Beam 101, they'll plan to enroll the first subject in the second half of this year. So what we're mainly concerned about here is Beam's runway. So we want to make sure they have enough cash until something good can happen, some good news can come in that will allow them to raise more capital at favorable rates if they need to. So say favorable terms and um, Beam's runway. So this would simply be looking at the cash they have on the books, how much they're burning, how long can they last sort of thing. So we can use earnings as a proxy for losses. They're not really the same thing in terms of cash burn versus net income, but let's just pretend it is. So in 2021, Beam lost an average of 92.5 million per quarter. And let's assume 90 million in losses per quarter. We can take the 1.2 billion in cash they had exiting this last quarter and get a runway of about 3.33 years. If we add to that the FISA revenues that they're recognizing, it should take Beam to about four years. So long enough for us to see whether or not the Pfizer deal is going to turn into something great. So um, Beam certainly has promise, but right now what you're largely in, investing in is a story. So just to conclude, when we're looking at gene editing as an investment thesis, there doesn't have to be a single winner, right? So that isn't the goal to try to analyze the technology and find out the winner. We just want to have exposure because there's a great deal of potential if you can address, say, you know, 50 to 90 percent of inherited diseases. So what we like about Beam is the pedigree of the founders. So we're hoping that they've been able to find the tools that are sufficient. They don't have to be the absolute best, but they need to be sufficient and sufficiently protected in terms of intellectual property. So in four years time maximum, we ought to know if that's the case based on the outcome of the big Pfizer deal. So please put your comments in the comments section. Make sure to subscribe to our channel. And thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video today.